How many believe he's turning it for good? Amen. Amen. Can we give God a praise tonight? <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. Welcome to Wednesday Word Encounter. Anybody ready for an encounter with the Word of God tonight? Yes, Amen. Father, we love you. We honor you. We bless you. We thank you for this awesome privilege to be in your house tonight. Father, we just ask you lead, guide, and direct everything that's said and done. May it be beneficial for your people and exalting and uplifting for your kingdom. We love you tonight, God. We give you praise for everything that is being, has been, and shall be accomplished by your mighty power. In Jesus' name, somebody shout amen. amen. Hallelujah. We are so excited about what God has for us tonight. I, I have a word for you. Um, but before we get into that, let me just, let me say, if you missed prayer night, you missed prayer night. Um, wow. I'm telling you, it was, it was, it was, another level experience and uh, and you need to be here for it I'm telling you God moved in such a such a tremendous fashion that uh, it's it's indescribable and unexplainable and so you need to make a point to be here on prayer night if you possibly can because of what God's doing amen and uh well, I just believe he's going to do the same thing again tonight. So, Amen. So, um, if you I'm going to try to do some of this house housekeeping stuff, if you haven't heard already, we are we are in the preliminary stages of launching our second campus, and it will be in Sealy, Texas. We had a great conference call, Pastor Roger and Faith, um, just the other night. And and God has directed them to a location in Sealy, Texas, which is just outside of the Houston area, if you're familiar with that area. And uh, I know they're going to do just a tremendous job there. And so we want you to be praying for them and praying over them, praying about that area. Pray over the people of that area. Amen. Amen. Uh, because a lot of prayer and time was spent in research, prayer, um, uh, seeking God's face. They, they've been pounding the pavement, uh, doing their due diligence to find the right people in the right location, and we believe we've found it. Uh, so Pastor Pam and I will be going down there sometime shortly uh, to, to go with them so they can show us everything that they have found. Uh, but I believe it's the right place because I believe they did their due diligence to, to seek God about it. And so we want you to pray over the people of that area that they'll have open and receptive hearts to the Word of God. Uh, what a fantastic time to be in the kingdom of God. And, and, and what a great time to be a part of Restoration Church. We are... We are on the move, amen. We are on the move, and this is this is this is prophetic. What what we're doing is prophetic word coming to pass, because I believe it was two years ago on Vision Sunday that I laid out the vision that I believe God was going to open a second campus, and look what God is doing, amen. And so this is coming to fruition, coming to pass. So please pray over that. And uh, seek God about uh, what they're doing there and uh, are going to be doing in Sealy, Texas. Amen. Stay, uh, stay up to date, if you will. I have been kind of chastised a little bit about social media. Uh, I don't like it, but it is a tool. And so I've been somewhat chastised. Uh, so uh, I have went back and, and kind of uh, re 
activated, I guess you will, not mine, but the Restoration Instagram page. Um, and, and I'm going to try to do a better job of, of, of having someone stay on top of that and the Facebook page uh, because it is a tool and it is something that, that, that a lot of people look at. And so why not use it for God? Amen. So <clears throat> I want you to do your part if you're on social media, which most of you probably are. I think most of the world is. Uh, go like the page, follow the page, whatever you do. You know, Facebook, I think you like it, and, and Instagram, I think you follow. So like and follow. And, uh, and also, uh, Pastor Roger has already uh, started a, a Insta, an Instagram page for the Restoration Church Sealy. So go in and follow that one as well. And, and I'll try to do better, but trying to make a presence on those pages some. Uh, and, and let's see where God takes that, okay? So go in and do that, if you will, and, and, and be a part of that. Glory to God. Now listen, we got a lot of, you know, it's getting close to the most wonderful time of the year. Right? Christmas. Who don't like Christmas. If you don't like Christmas, we're going to run you out of town because you're a Scrooge. Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year. And, and, and it, it is because that's when we celebrate the birth of Christ, of course. But I think sometimes that we forget about um, making time for each other during that season. We get so busy with other things. And so we're going to do something at Restoration Church. We're, we, we come up with a little game plan. And throughout the month of December, we're going to have little functions, little events, little get-togethers uh, so that we as family can just come together uh, and celebrate Jesus, celebrate Christmas, amen, and, and enjoy each other. The, the closer we get, the more we hang out together, the closer we get, and the closer we get, the more we know each other, right? And the more we know each other, the more we love each other. So, uh, and, and I understand maybe some, some of your work and, and other duties won't allow you to do everything, <clears throat> but we're going to put out a calendar, and it's going to have uh, just about every weekend in December, there's going to be something going on. And so uh, you look at your calendar and, and see if you can make any of these things, these events, and it's all going to be fun. It's going to be enjoyable, and we're just going to fellowship and have a good time together, okay? We're going to make Christmas happy, joyful, amen. It's not going to be a drag, and it's not going to be a bore because we don't like to shop or we don't like to put up Christmas lights or, you know, we but you know what? It's all part of it, so we're going to enjoy it, okay? So uh, so when we get this calendar, I don't want you to look at it and see how many of these events you can come to. Uh, one thing, I'll just tell you one thing that's on it. We're going to have a Christmas Eve candlelight service right here. Okay, so we'll keep it as, as much as humanly possible. We'll keep it to an hour. And just uh, and just have a quick little service, and and it'll be on Christmas Eve at seven o'clock. So from seven to eight, mark that time out. I know you're busy. I know Christmas Eve is a busy time with family. I understand that, but you can take an hour and be with us here in the church on Christmas Eve. All right, and we'll we'll just uh, worship the Lord together. Praise the Lord. So be on the lookout for that. I don't, we'll post it on the website. We'll post it on Facebook, Instagram when we get that calendar up uh, and, and make sure that, uh, that you're aware of that. And also one of the other things that we did not cover uh, last night in our Tier 1 leadership meeting, we didn't cover this, but I'm going to go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. We're going to look into doing a mass text instead of bulletins uh, because most people don't read the bulletins anyway. And so we're going to put everything that we have into a text. And everybody has a cell phone. 
and, and everybody gets text. If you don't, if you still got a phone that don't get text, go down to the Verizon store or the AT&T store and upgrade yourself. Okay, so we're looking into that. We'll let you know when that happens. That way you won't ever miss it because it'll go ding and everybody knows that when the thing goes ding, you're going to look at it. You may wad that, that bulletin up and throw it in the garbage, but when that phone dings, buddy, you look at it. So we, we, we're going we're gonna to help you out. All right? <clears throat> so we'll, we'll, we'll get all that together and uh, let you know when we get all that done, but we're going to be bugging you. And you can opt out of it if you want to, but if I find out you've opted out, Oh, yes, prayer outreach Saturday, Saturday at 10 o'clock in the morning, not at night. Saturday at 10 a.m., prayer outreach in the square in Eustace, okay? Volunteers to help pray for people. It's only going to be, what, an hour, an hour so uh Volunteer, if you got an hour that you can pull out of your day on Saturday morning, go out there and help pray for some people. You never know. You could be the one person that prays for that one person that was about ready to commit suicide. And you've saved their life. You never know. So instead of rolling over in your bed, think about that one person that you could have touched. Amen. So, volunteer, you can see Brother John, Sister Angela, Sister Tammy, and, and go volunteer and be a part of that prayer outreach over here in the square in Eustace. You have your Bible? Yes. You should always have your Bible. If you ain't got the old leather book, you got it on your phone. Everything's on your phone. I saw somebody put a picture out that had, uh, had a boom box had an old dial telephone, had a big computer, had all this stuff, and this guy's sitting around. He's got all this stuff around him, and it said something like, all of this is now in your pocket. Right? Who would have ever thought that your telephone, you could watch movies on, you could, you could look at something all the way across the world? Right? Who would have ever thought? On, your, on, your, on a telephone, okay, but you got it. So, well, I don't have a Bible app, www.biblegateway.com. I just helped you. Joel, chapter number two. We're still in our series, Let Freedom Ring. We're going to be in it for a while. don't know how long, but we're going to be in it for a while. But in this series, I want you to turn to the book of Joel. Chapter number two. Joel chapter number two. I just want to read the first two verses of this chapter, and it says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There has not ever been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations." Here's what the prophet said in the very first verse. He said, blow you the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm. Tonight I want to talk to you just briefly on that very thing, sounding the alarm. Father, I add your blessing on your word tonight. Open the eyes, ears, hearts, and spirits of your people as we receive your word. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord tonight.
what I have for you tonight or what God has for you tonight is not all that easy to swallow. <laughs> it may not be very digestible. You may have a case of spiritual indigestion when you leave here this evening. But here's what I do know, that it, it, it is food that we must partake of. Although the pill may be hard to swallow, it is a pill that's necessary for the body. And so I want you to keep that in mind tonight as you perhaps squirm just a little on your seat or pull your feet under the chair. Joel said prophetically, blow the trumpet and sound the alarm. So what he's saying then is we need to sound the alarm through the sound of the trumpet. Just as kind of a foundational uh, beginning tonight, let, let me just kind of run through this real quickly. But trumpets, trumpets were used for a variety of things in the Bible. Um, not as much anymore, uh, but in the Bible and even in more recent history, trumpets were used for several reasons. One of those reasons was dedicatory in nature. It was a trumpet of dedication. You remember Solomon in the book of Second Chronicles in chapter number five, six, somewhere along in there. The Bible said that, that the trumpet was blown as Solomon finished the temple of God that he built for God. And you remember the glory cloud came in the temple where the priest couldn't even minister. But, but one thing that we kind of look over within that story is that the priest blew the trumpet to announce the dedication of the temple. And before Solomon ever stood in the temple to pray, that great dedicatory prayer that he prayed, the trumpet was blown. And, and, and there were, when the trumpet was blown, one could discern uh, what it was being blown for by the sound or the note that it was making. Uh, that's why Paul says in his writings in, in, in 1 Corinthians 13, that's why he says that uh, it, it, it's like if, if we come in, he's speaking of speaking in tongues. He says, if everybody comes in and everybody speaks in tongues and nobody can understand what anybody's saying, he said it's like blowing an uncertain trumpet or the trumpet making an uncertain sound attempting to call men to battle because nobody knows what's going on. Uh, and so each trumpet had a note that was played for that particular event or that particular reason. For instance, the dedication trumpet would have a note that people could readily discern. And then there was a trumpet blown for a marriage announcement. Uh, the father of the bride, the mother of the bride, they would, they would have the trumpeter stand in the street and lift the shofar and blow a particular note upon the trumpet to announce the marriage of their daughter to uh, so-and-so. And, and, and so everybody that heard it then would readily understand because they knew the note that was blown. There was no uncertainty. And as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, there was a trumpet that was also sounded for battle. Uh, and we can see this all the way up in recent history when the cavalry would ride out uh, on the plains of America to do battle or uh, whatever they were doing and, and, and they would blow the trumpet. They always carried a trumpeter into battle and such was the case in, in biblical times. They, they would announce that the battle was engaged by blowing the shofar and it had a particular note in and of itself that would let everybody know that it was time for battle. Wouldn't it be strange if the battle trumpet was sounded and yet the trumpeter would blow the wrong note and it was blowing the note of a marriage announcement. 
And that's what Paul was saying. If you blow the wrong note upon the trumpet, then it's an uncertainty and nobody knows what's happening. Can I just stop for a minute? Just pause here for a second and say this, that there's a lot of uncertain sounds being blown in the churches of America. I knew that would go over too big, but it, there, there's there's there, there there's a confusion and, and a noise that that is not ringing true to the ear from the trumpeter that's blowing the trumpet. We don't know what to do because we can't discern the sounds. Are y'all with me tonight? We, there are there are sound. We can hear. We can discern the sound of a freight train from the sound uh, of an airplane, or we can discern the sound of an automobile from that of a motorcycle, or whatever the case may be. All of these sounds have distinct and different. Uh, 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 sounds upon our ear and so we hear them we know exactly what's coming the problem with the modern day church is we are giving out all kinds of sounds and none of them make any sense and so there is an uncertainty in the pulpits of America, there's an uncertainty in the pews of the church houses in America and nobody knows what to do because when we should have been sounding the battle cry, we think it's a dedication. When we should have been sounding a marriage announcement, we think it's a battle cry and so on and so forth because we are so, we're living in a state of spiritual confusion. Can I say this to you? God declares, the Bible declares that God is not the author of confusion. And so if God is not the author of confusion, that only leaves one other option. And so what has happened is we have allowed the arch enemy of God to lift the shofar to his lips and blow tunes and blow notes upon the trumpet and we have listened to him thinking that it was God. Ain't nobody in here tonight, but I'm going to preach anyway. And so we are uncertain as to what to do because we cannot properly and effectively discern the sound. There's another trumpet, another sound that would call a fast or a solemn assembly. There's a, another sound that would come from the shofar that would call in the year of jubilee as it was called in. And, and all of these sounds had, had different notes that were played and the people could readily discern. But there is a sound, that another one that is the coronation of a king. When the king was to be set on the throne and to occupy the office of the king of the land, there would be a trumpeter that would sound and he would blow the notes on the shofar and everybody knew that the king was about to be coronated. Can I tell you that First Thessalonians chapter 4 said there's about to be a sound. There's about to be a trumpet that is blown, but this time it's not going to come from a mortal being. It's going to come from the lips of Gabriel, the archangel of God. And he's going to blow the trumpet, and when he blows the trumpet, uh, there's going to be one who was born in a manger who suffered on the cross of Calvary who was cast into a borrowed tomb but when the trumpet is blown this time it's not going to be a marriage it's not going to be a dedication it's not going to be even the year of jubilee it's not going to be a battle cry but this time when the sound comes forth from the shofar it's going to be the coronation of the king of kings and the lord of Lord, he won't be coronated as a babe in a manger. Y'all might be in trouble because I feel the preacher coming. He won't be coronated as a man who hung on a cross. He won't be coronated as some dead body that's thrown into a borrowed tomb. He won't be coronated as just a leader of a ragtag band of disciples. But this time, he's going to be coronated as the king of glory, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. And 
when the trumpet is blown on that day, every knee shall bow and every tongue is going to confess that he and he alone is the king. And there's none other beside. I don't know if I got anybody, but there's a sound that's about to happen. And can I tell you that all of those who have not listened to the noise and the confusion and the uncertainty of all of these other trumpets that are being blown in the earth today. Everybody that has had their ear tuned in to that sound, we've been anxiously waiting. We've been holding our breath, as it were, and waiting for that sound. Hey, God, there's a lot of noise going on in the world, but my ears are in tune for one sound. My ears are in tune for one trumpet blast for one note on the shofar. And when that trumpet sounds, when that note rings out through the eons of time, when that note rings out through the atmosphere, my feet are going to lose their gravitational pull to this people planet, and I'm going to rise to be with him in the middle of the air. Is anybody up in this house on a Wednesday night ready to hear the sound? Somebody just tell your neighbor, I'm listening for a sound. There's another sound. There's another trumpet that's used, and this is where we want to deal with tonight because it's the trumpet of alarm. It's the sound of the alarm. Not battle, not dedication, not coronation, but this is a sound for alarm. And this is what Joel the prophet said. He said, you need trumpeter, you need to lift the shofar to your lips and you need to blow a sound because there's something happening. Listen, an alarm is unnecessary if everybody's awake. You don't set your alarm in the middle of the day on your clock, on your phone, on your watch to wake up in the middle of the day because you're already awake. But it's in the nighttime hours when your body is sleeping, when your eyes are closed in sleep and you set the alarm because you know that you need to be up at six o'clock in the morning. And so if I don't set the alarm, I'm liable to sleep through six o'clock. I may not wake up until 8 o'clock, but the problem is if I wake up at 8 o'clock, it will be too late. And so I have to set my alarm because I'm sleepy. Because if I'm awake, I don't need an alarm. So Joel said, blow the trumpet and sound the alarm. There is in the chapter prior to chapter two, Joel chapter number one, there is a story that begins to unfold. As Joel the prophet begins to prophetically unfold this story, he tells it, this way, and I paraphrase, he said, there is an invading force. There is an army of evildoers that are landing upon our shores and infiltrating our towns and our cities. There is an invading force, a foreign enemy, if you will, Someone who does not belong in our countryside is making their way onto the shores of our nation. And he says it this way. He says it's going to be a four-pronged or a four-phased attack. He said it's going to be an army so great that it's without number, so mighty, so terrible, so powerful that Opposing forces tremble in their proverbial shoes when this army comes to call. 
Joel, what are you speaking of? What are you talking about? He said, he said, I'm going to liken this army to a swarm of locusts. He said, but when they come at first, the first phase is the palmer worm. See, that may not mean much to you until you know exactly what a palmer worm is, but a palmer worm is actually the migratory locust in its larva state. Watch. It's infantile. It's small. It's insignificant. It doesn't seem like much. It's harmless. Y'all not in here. Joel said the first phase of the attack when it comes is going to look harmless and insignificant. In fact, you probably won't even be able to notice it all that much. When it comes in the first phase, a lot of people will become so accustomed to what they are doing and how they're living their lives that this first phase of the attack will be almost unnoticeable. After all, it's just baby steps. After all, we, 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 we don't need to do anything because it's so small. We, we don't need to address this issue because it's really not that big of a deal. I ain't hearing nobody say nothing, but... We don't really need to go and put it on the altar because it really is not that big of a deal. We don't need to go repent of that little sin because y'all not hearing me, because it really doesn't mean all that much. And if I keep it tucked away in the dark recesses of my mind, nobody is going to see it anyway. And it starts out small and harmless and seemingly insignificant. And we just kind of brush it under the carpet and tuck it away in a corner somewhere and we don't want to deal with it because if we deal with it, it means that somebody's going to see that we got some larva that's setting up in our life. Y'all not hearing me. Little eggs. It don't mean all that much. It's not really that bad. We, we, we can allow that because after all, what can that little thing do? We can get away with that. It's not that big of a deal. Come on, God. I mean, I give my tithe every week so you can let me buy with this little larva. I mean, you know, I serve on the board of the church. You, you can overlook that, God. Just, just don't, don't, don't let it come to light. Just, they, just leave them alone. They're not. It's probably gonna fade away after a while. It, it'll just go away on its own. Don't, don't worry about it. We'll just sweep it under the carpet. And the church is full of issues that we have swept under the carpet for years, and the entire body of Christ is crawling with maggots and larva because we have refused to deal with it thinking that it's too small. Just a palmer worm. Joel said, but wait. Wait, you gotta understand something. That's only the first phase. Can I tell you something? The larva is coming in and it's, it's looking for a place to inhabit. 
and it will find anywhere it can find to attach itself to the bark of a tree or the side of a house or a limb or somewhere. All it wants to do is find somewhere to attach itself, to grab on to. Can I talk to somebody tonight? Just grab on to something. If you'll let me stay just a little while, if you'll let me hold on to you for, am I talking to anybody in this house? If you let me hold on just a little bit longer. Joel said what's going to happen is then that little larva is going to hatch. And when it hatches, it's going to begin to grow. And he said then the second phase of the attack is going to happen. But the problem is because you refuse to deal with the first phase, then the second phase, it's already on your shores. And he said the second phase is like the locust, the short horn grasshopper. Watch this. Many times it will be by itself or one here and one there, barely noticeable because they don't all hatch at once. And you start to see a little more, a little more here, a little more there. But the problem is, is before you can do anything about it, they all begin to hatch one after the other. And the next thing you know, you have a swarm of shorthorn grasshoppers or locusts, which will literally devastate and rip to shreds the crops or the fields or the grass or, or, or the pasture for the animals and literally leave nothing but dust and dirt in its way. And now you're looking and you're thinking, I should have done something when it was small. Now the locust has had a population explosion and now they're everywhere. But Joel said, wait, it gets worse. He said, because then comes the canker worm. If I, if I change one letter in the word canker, it becomes cancer. Do you know what cancer does? It eats. When cancer is left unchecked in the human body, it will eat everything in its path until there's literally nothing left inside the human body and you become nothing but a bag of dirt. It is indiscriminate. It will eat lungs and hearts and livers and bones and kidneys. It will destroy everything in its path. Watch, that's what Joel said the canker worm will do. It will spread like a cancer because you left it go unchecked when it was in its infant stage and now it becomes too late. We're in the third phase of the attack. We're well on our way into this attack from this invading foreign enemy. But because you left it unchecked, now it, is, it has become a cancer throughout the entire body. And the canker worm lives and it strips the leaves from the trees and it strips the foliage from the fields. It strips the shrubs and the trees until it literally leaves nothing but skeletons standing in its wake. It will eat itself if there's nothing else to eat. Cancer, canker. Watch, so the little sin, the little enemy, the little devil, the little issue that you refuse to deal with has now spread like a cancer. And then he said, the fourth phase is worse than them all. 
The call is, is now magnified to such proportion that it's seemingly unstoppable. And the fourth phase, he says, is the caterpillar. Wait, caterpillar? That pretty little fuzzy thing? That thing that turns into a butterfly? Do you understand that deceit and deception is one of the greatest tools of your adversary? And you let that pretty little fuzzy caterpillar in your life because you think he's harmless. But the truth is that he has already been cancer and has already eat out your insides. And now he has tricked you into believing that everything is okay, everything is fine. An invading force has entered into your land, into on the shores of your land, and has now eaten everything in its path. And now he presents himself the Bible said that even the devil can transform himself into an angel of light. Are y'all in this place? And he looks harmless and he looks cute and he looks fuzzy and he looks like something you should play with. But the truth is, is that the caterpillar is worse than the canker worm. He's worse than the palmer worm. He's worse than the locust because he has such a ferocious appetite that he is never, ever satisfied. And you thought it was cute. But that sin is never satisfied. That darkness that you've been hiding, that thing that you refuse to deal with is never satisfied. It never gets enough and it continues to eat and eat and eat until there is nothing, absolutely nothing left. And now Joel said, if you look, the fields are stripped. The fig tree is stripped of its bark. There's no fruit. There's no, there's no livestock because there's no pasture and the livestock have died. There's no crops growing in the field. There is nothing left standing in the wake of this invading force because we refuse to deal with it in the beginning. We could have stopped it. We could have squashed it. But Joel said it's too late. You let it happen because you were sleepwalking. And little by little, this enemy has invaded your shores and stripped every ounce of your freedom, your liberty, your independence, and now you are left with your jaws dropped looking at the devastation of what he has done in your land because you were asleep. There's no sustenance. He said in verse 10, he said, the corn, the oil, and the wine. Listen to me, the corn, which is the meal, the bread, if you will. The oil, which is the spirit. The wine, which is the blood. He said, all of it has been destroyed. All of it has been stolen. All of it has been devastated by an enemy that you could have stopped. So who's to blame? Who's to blame because we were asleep? Verse 11, you be ashamed, you husbandmen and you vine dressers 
because the wheat and the barley and the harvest has perished on your watch. Wait, 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 wait. Husbandman means caretaker. Vine dresser means caretaker and provider. Watch. So who's to blame? The caretakers. Those who were supposed to be watchmen. Those who were supposed to be standing on the watchtower watching for the people. Those who were supposed to cry out and lift up the trumpet when an enemy was coming into their territory. Those who were supposed to wake the people up but because they wanted to preach something that the people wanted to hear, the people fell asleep. Because they wanted the applause of the people. Because they wanted the accolades and the pats on the back because they were pursuing popularity instead of the presence of God. They refused to preach it and they let down the standard and they compromised and they caved into the political correctness of this age and they wanted to be popular more than they wanted to be in the presence. didn't care for them. That's why they're asleep. Do you know what a vine dresser does? One of his main jobs, he prunes. A vine dresser doesn't just go to the vine and say, my, aren't you a beautiful vine? Oh, my goodness, you are so pretty. I'm so glad you're in my vineyard. A vine dresser says, hey, I see a little something, something that I need to snip off. I see a little something I need to get out of you. If you're ever going to grow up to be the vine that you're supposed to be, I got to get rid of this little thing right here. I got to pull the weeds up around the bottom of your root system. I got to prune you a little bit. If you're ever going to be what I called you to be, if you're ever going to be what I planted you to be, I got to prune you a little bit. I know you're pretty, but I got to get rid of some stuff so you can be strong and so you can be rooted and so you can be grounded and I know it hurts a little bit but I got to you can hate me if you want to but I got to prune you you can get puffed up and poke out your lip and be mad with me and turn your head when I walk down the street but I got to prune you because I'm doing it for your good. I'm trying to make you stronger. I'm trying to make you better. I'm trying to let your root system grow a little bit deeper. I'm trying to let you get a little rooted and a little grounded. And it's not because I don't like you. It's because I love you that I have to prune you a little. guys have let these guys fall asleep. Joel said, shame on you, preachers. Oh, 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 you don't think that's what he's talking about? Okay, let's go down to verse number 13. Gird yourselves and lament, cry, you priests, how you ministers for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholding from the house of your God and you are to blame. 
you have failed in your duties. You've fallen down on your job and you've let the people fall asleep because you were so worried about your reputation and you were so worried about how many people would like you on social media and you were so worried about how you could get a little blue check mark beside your name on Facebook and Instagram. You were so worried about puffing yourself up. You let the people fall asleep and now the enemy is on the shore and devastating everything thing in its path. Shame on you. Shame on you, you backslidden preacher. Shame on you. You're to blame. I think I've come to the conclusion that the, 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 the struggle that we're currently in, the struggle that we, that we are facing at this very moment is, is, is one that the majority of the people don't even comprehend. I, I've come to the conclusion that, that most of us have no idea of the battle that we're facing. Because preachers and pastors and leaders have not kept the people awake. They haven't pruned and they haven't dressed the vine. And so now we're left with a church full of people who are listening for sounds, but they can't discern the sound. And we're sleepwalking through this thing called life and we're sleepwalking through this thing called Christianity and we're hoping upon hope that one day that we may just hear Jesus say, well done. Can I tell you something? You don't have to hope. You don't have to wish. You don't have to dream. You can know that you know that you know. You but we're facing a battle that we don't even comprehend. Listen, the economic and cultural battle, the economic and cultural struggle that we are currently engaged in, those are really just the offsprings or the results of the real war. Listen, let me make something clear to you. They're spouting it all over the news if you choose to listen to it. Gas is going up, food's going up, there's a shortage of this, ships are locked out of the harbor, can't get in, COVID has messed everything up. OPEC messing everything up. We want to turn to green energy, so we got to shut down oil wells. And because of that, you may have to suffer at the pump for a while. And everything that you hear is bad news. The economy is, is tanking. There's a recession coming. Unemployment is up. The job market is down. Nobody wants to work. You can go in every town in America and see signs that say, we're now hiring, please, somebody, anybody. Nobody wants to work. The government's flat broke, handing out money, handing out checks like it's water ain't got the money in the first place and everything that you hear is bad news. The economy's tanking and that's only one front. There's another front called the cultural front where blacks are being pitted against the whites, Hispanics against Asians. Oh, y'all don't want to hear the truth. Isn't it funny that until the news media got a hold of a few little incidents and a few little things that happened in America, isn't it funny that everybody seemed to me like we were getting along just fine? But now there's a cultural war. Protestants against Catholics. Watch. Vaccinated against unvaccinated. Do you think that's coincidence? 
That is a strategic move by your adversary who is working through certain people to try to pit you against each other. Can I tell you something? The church is more divided now than it's ever been in the history of the church because you got some mega church preachers that close their church down and say you can't come back to church and then you got other preachers that say we're going to have church anyhow and now they're at each other's throats because I'm right and you're wrong and ain't we, we are not going to get along and we're not going to budge so you do your thing and I'll do mine. Can I tell you something? If you ever get to heaven, there ain't going to be no do your thing and let him do his thing. It's going to be God's way or it's going to be no way. I Ain't nobody in this place. There's an economic war and there's a cultural war. Watch this. But that's only the result of the real war. Those are only results. Those are only byproducts of the real war. Watch this. There's a four-phase attack. Y'all got some time? Because, like I got a little more. There's a four-phase attack. Watch this. And it's not coincidence that there are four target areas that your enemy has targeted. You ready for this? The first one is the entertainment industry. There ain't no more leave it to beaver. The worst thing that you saw on Andy Griffith was that he would fire up a cigarette once in a while. There's no more Ozzy and Harriet. Now there's Ozzy Osbourne. Demon worshiping Satanist. The entertainment industry has been a target of this four-phased attack. Watch me. And the enemy has won. Because we have been sleepwalking and we have refused to confront it and we've stood back and let it happen and now everything that you see, it's not just in Hollywood anymore. It's not just on the big screen in theaters but you can't turn on Hallmark for God's sake without seeing two men kiss each other or two women walking down the street holding hands. Y'all ain't in this place. You can't hang with me tonight. I'm too anointed for you. I'm telling you somebody needs to stand up and call all sin, sin, and stop compromising. Hallmark, Disney. Walt Disney World. You know how many times we've taken our children to Walt Disney World? I can't even count. And now they're selling T-shirts to children and Mickey Mouse ears to children wrapped in a gay pride flag. And a demon-possessed rapper can get on stage and glorify killing police officers and cussing out your mama and sleeping with hoes and doing drugs and snorting cocaine up your nose and injecting drugs into your vein. And we got children as little as 12 and 13 years old on the front row being filled with this garbage. Where are the parents? parent and you let your little child go to hear that garbage, you ought to be publicly horse whipped in the town square. Because sex and 
drugs and violence is glorified in the music industry, in the movie industry, and in television. That's all you see. You can't watch television anymore. You know what I watch? I watch gun smoke. Reruns of gun smoke because that's all that's clean on television. Most of the time, even sports ain't clean anymore. Promoting some gay agenda. I know y'all didn't come to hear this, but I'm going to preach it anyhow since you're here. Oh, what about the public school system? Target area number two. Because if the enemy can get to your children, they can destroy your nation. He ain't worried about you too much if you're 75, 80 years old, get ready to pass on to glory. He's worried about that generation that's coming after you. He wants to raise and train them up in the way that he thinks they should go. And when they're old, he hopes they won't depart from it. Y'all ain't hearing me. And he wants to fill them and pump them as full of junk as he can get them right in our own public school systems. Mama, did you know that me that we come from monkeys? That's what they teach your children. Evolution. They don't have health class anymore. They have sex education class. Where they teach that it's okay for Johnny to have two daddies. Do you know that in some public school system, they caught them actually using, I'm not going to get graphic, stuff to teach them what mommies and daddies do or daddies and daddies. Half of the public school curriculum ought to be tossed in a bonfire and burned up and the person that wrote them ought to be horsewhipped. The gay agenda and abortion and sex education, evolution. What about target area number three? How about the government? Do you know that the Bible said that the nation is blessed when there's a prince, the priest, and the prophet all in alignment? The king, the priest, and the prophet, when they're all in alignment together, that nation is blessed. We don't see that very much anymore, if ever. Because now as government officials, we cave into financial kickbacks and political correctness and we sell, we pimp and prostitute ourselves out as servants, as employees of the people. They prostitute themselves out for the highest dollar. Y'all not hearing me. And because of that, damnable laws are passed. Because of things just like that, of laws like abortion and gay marriage are passed right under our little churchy noses because we're too asleep. We have fallen asleep on the job because preachers quit preaching and leaders quit leading and servers quit serving and Christians stayed asleep. And then we wonder why well, all of this is happening. Socialism is one of the tools that they're using today in the government system of the United States. Do you know why? Because socialism says we want you dependent upon us. In socialism, government is God. Are you hearing me? Oh, I know most preachers don't have the fortitude to preach like this. In socialism, government becomes God. 
Have you noticed in the last few years, especially in the last 10 months or so, that they're doing everything in their power to get the American population to become totally dependent on the government. Why? Because they want to be God. Let me tell you something. If you take my house, I'm still going to serve God. If you take my job, I'm still going to serve God. It, 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 if you take my electricity, I'm still going to serve God. You can take my vehicle, I'm still going to serve God. You can take my paycheck, I'm still going to serve God because government is not my God. I serve one called Jehovah Jireh. I serve one that says he's my provider. He's all sufficient. Ain't nobody up in this house with me. He's the one that cares for me. He's my vine dresser. He's my husbandman. He's... Oh, wait, but there's still one more. You ready for this? Target area number four, churches. 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 How do, how do they invade our churches? That's our safe place. It's our sanctuary. Oh, no, because now we preach a watered-down version of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Now, no, 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 no. See, we don't want to talk about the Holy Ghost. We don't want to talk about speaking in other tongues. We don't want to talk about miracles. We don't want to talk about power with God, power to tread on serpents and scorpions, power to cast out devils. We don't want to talk about that because, see, that confuses people and that scares people and that runs people off. And all it is is a strategic move by your adversary to creep into your church houses and to silence your voice and make your preacher become some little lily livered cotton string backbone puppet and pulpiteer instead of a prophet and will not stand up and preach to you the word of God. We have lowered the standard. We have compromised. We've hugged necks with the world and we've watered down the gospel. My Bible tells me come out from among them and be ye separate says the Lord. My Bible says that darkness and light cannot survive together. Fear and faith cannot coexist. Somebody has got to go. My Bible says you've got to stand and having done all to stand. They've infiltrated your church houses and they've told you that you've got to close down because of COVID. And most of the churches in America listened. Do you see how easy that was? They didn't even have to fire a shot. All they had to do was instill fear. Well, when we do let you open back up, you've got to wear a mask. And some churches have become so mind-numbed and, 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 and robotic tools of the enemy that now they say you can't come to church unless you're vaccinated. And you gotta show your car to get in the door of the church. I will never go into your church. Even if I was vaccinated, I wouldn't go in your church because I ain't about to show nobody a card for nothing. You want to see my card? Here it is, baby. It's 66 books full of it. Isn't it crazy? You got to show a card? for vaccination to get in restaurants and churches, but you don't have to show a card to vote? Common sense is not very common anymore. And preachers have allowed the enemy to occupy the pews and the seats of their churches. Until now, the entire swarm of locusts and caterpillars have filled the entire body of Christ, and we have done nothing about it because we were asleep. Hmm. 
we've embraced religion over righteousness. We've embraced feelings over the infilling of the Holy Ghost. No, we've embraced greasy grace over godliness and thereby allowing the enemy to occupy the pews every single Sunday morning and many times the pulpits. Somebody has to sound the alarm. <clears throat> there is a church that is sleepwalking and somebody has to be bold enough, brave enough, and bad enough to sound the alarm. Yes, yes, somebody has got to quit hitting the snooze button and wake up. Because your neighbor tell them it's time to sound the alarm. The truth of the matter is that the church, while the devil is loose and rampaging across this land, the church has been sleepwalking. And meanwhile, hordes and hordes of our generations are hellbound and on their way to an eternity without God. And we have remained asleep. While our friends and family and loved ones are dying and going to a devil's hell, we have stayed asleep. We haven't heard the alarm. Where are the preachers? Where are the preachers? Where are the prophets? Where are the ones like Isaiah in Isaiah 58 and 1 that said, cry loud and spare not? Where are the preachers that, that he said will show the nation, the people, the transgression and their sin? Where are the preachers that will stand up and preach the unadulterated, infallible word of God instead of some man's opinion or some sermonette they downloaded off the internet? Where are the preachers who get on their face before God and get a download from heaven instead of looking at something on the internet to try to pull it together on Sunday morning? Where are the men and women of God that will stand in the face of the adversary and declare that hell is still hot and heaven is still real. Where are the men of God and women of God that will say sin is still sin and no matter how you paint it up, puff it up, or powder it up, it's still gonna be sin and you've got to fall down at the foot of a old rugged cross and give your heart to Jesus. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Where are those kind of preachers? I don't need a motivational speaker. I need a preacher. I don't need a life coach. I need a prophet. I don't care how many books you sold. I don't care how many TV shows you've been on. Do you have an anointing from God? Can you lay your hands on the sick and they shall recover? Can you cast out a devil? If you can't do that, you're not a preacher. Sit down and shut up. You compromiser, you backslider, sit down. I've had enough of playboys in pulpits. It's time for a prophet. I've had enough of pimps prostituting the gospel. I need a preacher. I need a preacher to shake his bony finger under my nose and tell me where I'm going wrong. I need somebody to tell me how to act right, how to... I know y'all want to go home. Somebody has to sound the alarm. Somebody's got to wake up a hellbound generation and tell them that Jesus is coming. We got to scream from the mountaintops. We got to shout from the rooftops that Jesus is making a return that there is a judgment day that's coming, that hell is a reality, and eternal separation from God is the worst punishment that you will ever have. Somebody has to shout it. Somebody has to lift their voice like a trumpet. Somebody has to cry out to the people, repent, turn from your wicked ways. Where are those preachers? Got to 
to sound the alarm. We must cry like Leonard Ravenhill as he said these words and he penned them in the book called Why Revival Tarries. Give me souls lest I die. We have to be as committed as the Moravians who sold themselves into slavery so that they could deliver slaves into freedom. Where are those Christians? I'm not talking about some weak kneed skinny jeans wearing 2021 Christian sipping on a latte with foam all over his upper lip. I'm talking about a preacher. I'm talking about a man of God. I'm talking about a woman of God who will stand in the pulpit and not tell you what you want to hear. Where are those preachers? Where are the preachers who will tell you that you've got to get uncomfortable with being comfortable? Where are the preachers who will tell you you've got to come out of sin and separate yourself? We need men and women of God like that in 2021. I don't care how modern you are. That doesn't impress me. I don't care how tight your skinny jeans are. That doesn't impress me. The Bible said John wore camel's hair and ate locusts and wild honey. Oh, you missed that part. He ate the locusts. I'll show you. Somebody has to sound the alarm. The only reason an alarm is needed is because somebody's asleep. And we've been sleepwalking for generations. We've got to sound the alarm until a hellbound generation slams on the brakes and does an about face and run, screaming, crying desperately to the foot of an old rugged bleeding cross and cries out to a savior. We have to sound the alarm. We have to sound the alarm until restoration comes. I'm going to close with this, but I want to read something to you. In Joel chapter number 2, the same chapter we're in, verse number 23, after he tells them to sound the alarm and call a solemn assembly and, and call a fast, he said, let the priests, the ministers, weep between the porch and the altar. Let them become a bridge from the outside to the end. Let them lay down and themselves be the bridge. The priests, those of you that have compromised, those of you that have let down the standard, those of you who have climbed down off the watchtower and done your own thing. He said, repent before the Lord and fall down between the porch and the altar and become a bridge to bridge the gap between fallen humanity and an almighty God. Lay yourself down as a sacrifice. Where are the preachers who will lay down and let somebody walk over top of them just to get to Jesus? And he said, if you do this, this is what he says. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Why? Because your fields have been devastated, your crops have been destroyed, your pasture has been taken over by the locust, the palmer worm, the canker worm, and the caterpillar. He said, but watch, but if you get on your face before God, if you repent of your wicked ways, if you call upon the name of the Lord, if you lay down between the porch and the altar, he said, I'll bring it all back. Y'all ain't in this place. I'll give it all back to you. I'll, th those barren fields that were not producing, I'll make them productive again. How are you going to do that, God? Because I'm going to send the former rain and the latter rain all at the same time. I'm going to rain on it until it grows. I'm going to rain on it until it breathes again. I'm going to rain on it until it lives again. I'm going to rain on it until it starts being productive again. I don't know about you, but I say let the rain fall. Let it rain on America. Let it rain on a backslidden church. Let it rain on a compromising 
preacher. Let it, let, 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 let it, let it rain. Let somebody shout, let it rain. God said, my rain will make it grow again. My, my rain will make it produce again. When the enemy thought he had won, I'll rain on it. When the enemy thought that he had wiped it all out, I'll just rain on it. And when I rain on it, it'll be like the day of Pentecost. When I rain on it, it your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall see vision. Old men shall dream dream. When I rain on it, my spirit will fall upon all flesh. And that which is dead will resurrect to life again. When I rain, let it rain. He said, I give you the rain, the former and the latter in the same month. Watch this. And then the floor shall be full of wheat. Everything that was unproductive will grow again. Mm, and the vats will overflow with wine and oil. Remember verse 10? He said, the wine's gone, the oil's gone. The blood's gone and the spirit's gone. The blood's gone, the spirit's gone. He said, I'm about to give it back. I'm... I got a word for America. God's about to reign. He's about to give it back. I know it looks gloomy. I know it looks dark. I know it looks like all hell has broken loose, but I need to prophesy to America. I need to prophesy to the remnant American church. God's about to God's about to reign on this place again. God's about to reign on America again. He's about to reign on the church again. And everything that was dead is about to spring back shout if you believe ah, I got to hurry I got to hurry watch this y'all overflow with oil and wine and I will restore I will restore to you the years not just the stuff. I'll restore the years. Do you know what I'm trying to tell you? Because when the enemy destroys your field, he doesn't just destroy the crop, but he destroys last year, this year, and next year. Y'all ain't hearing me. But God said, I'm not just going to give you back the stuff. I'm going to give you back the years that the enemy took. The years that the palmer worm, the canker worm, the locust, and the caterpillar invaded your land and took. He said, I'm about to give you your years back. Ah, he said, I'm going to redeem the time. I'm going to give it back. I'm going to give it all back. I'm going to give yesterday back. I'm going to give today back. And I'm going to give you your future back. I will restore. Restoration. Look at your neighbor and say, restoration's coming. Restoration's coming. God's about to reign and restore. I got to hurry. I got to hurry. Watch, that the army I sent among you and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that have dealt wondrously with you and my people will never need to be ashamed again. I ain't got nobody in this house. I dare you slap your neighbor a high five and tell him you're about to get restored. You about everything that you lost and then some. You about to get restored. Everything the devil took from you and then some. All the years that he took from you. All the yeah, Tobo I feel like preaching now. All the years that he took. Ah, I'm gonna give it all back. I wish you'd look at the devil and point your finger under his nose right now and tell him you got to give it back. My God's about to reign. He's about to reign. He's about to restore. You better give it. Give it. Give it. Get, 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 get. Give it back. Give it. Ah, I feel some drops already falling. I feel the rain already falling. I feel restoration coming. I feel like somebody is about to walk in your 
you about to walk up in your barn and see the vats overflowing with oil. See the floor full of wheat. I'm prophesying to somebody. Get up in your barn and start looking at what the devil took from you. I got it. I got it. I got it all. Throw your head back and give God a shout. Give him, give him a shout. He's worthy. Come on, shout, let it rain. Let it rain. Let it rain, let it rain till my crops come back. Let, let it rain till my vats overflow. Let it rain till my floor's full of wheat. Let it rain. Ah. So you ain't supposed to be acting like that on a Wednesday night, Pastor. I know it, but I just feel some rain coming. I just, I just, I just, I double, I feel some rain coming. See, I know what it looks like in America. I know what it looks like in the backslidden church. But I also know what my God said. And he's about to open the heavens and let it rain. Ah, Bishop Paul S. Morton said, open the floodgates of heaven and let it rain. Let it rain. Listen, so if I'm going to leave you with anything tonight, if all you heard was this, hear this. Deal with it before it gets out of control. because you're going to have to fight a whole lot harder once the pommel worm becomes a locust the locust becomes a canker worm the canker worm becomes a caterpillar you're going to have to fight a whole lot harder but here's what I know my Bible says let God be true not a man that he should lie nor the son of man now listen if he said it he will do it that which he has promised he's able also to perform and as he spoke through the prophet Joel he said I will restore here's the thing about God God's a God of covenant you know what covenant means? You have a part and he has a part. Watch this. And every blessing of God is conditional except one. And that's that he loves you. That's unconditional. But every other blessing is a covenant blessing. What are you saying, Pastor? If you do this, I'll do that. If you blow the trumpet and sound the alarm, I'll turn it around. If you weep between the porch and the altar, I'll restore. If you repent from your wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and I'll heal your land. If you call upon my name, I'll hear you and I'll answer you. make it rain on everything that was dead in your life and it will produce again even in 2021 absolutely absolutely do you know that Jesus waited four days on purpose before he went to the graveside of Lazarus because he wanted to make sure that it was as dark as it could be and Lazarus was as dead as he could get. 
And the situation was as hopeless as anyone thought it could ever be. Because he said, then, that's when I get my glory. Did you ever stop to think that 2020 and 2021 is about as dark as we've ever been in America? It's just about that time when the alarm clock goes off. And somebody wakes up and sounds the alarm and God said, that's what I wanted to hear. Now I'm going to make it rain so I can get the glory. Father, we love you. God, we praise you tonight. We magnify the name of Jesus because his name is worthy to be praised. There is no other God but you. And we lift up your name tonight. Father, I pray that this word has found its mark in the hearts and lives of all men and women across this congregation. I pray, Father, that it takes root as a seed and grows and matures in the spirit and soul of every man, woman, boy, or girl in this place tonight. God, help us to sound the alarm. Help us to wake from our slumber and see the dire necessity of an almighty God in our situation. We love you tonight. We praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. I know it wasn't easy, but it was necessary. Every church in America, every people in America, every people group from the White House all the way down to the crack house needs to hear this word. And I pray that you have not only heard tonight, but I pray that it causes you to become a doer of the word. Amen. God bless you. Listen, Sunday morning, Sunday morning, 1030, we are going to rock this house. Okay? I believe, listen, last, you see this man right over here? Last Sunday morning, he walked in here a stroke victim. Y'all ain't hearing me. He's been walking on a walker, on a cane, with a leg brace. Couldn't talk right, couldn't move right. But the power of God hit him last Sunday morning. And I want you to look at him now. I want you to look at him now. There's the spot. Don't tell me that God's still not working miracles. Y'all know, y'all seen him when he's come in this house. He's been in hospital after hospital and therapy and rehab and but God. I'm telling you, it's real. That's going to become commonplace. That's, that's going to become the norm and not the exception. Yeah. Now he's ready to go do ministry in the prisons. Amen. Listen, if you want to give tonight, we got text to give on the screen. Serve team members will have the buckets by the door. If you want to give, you can give as you walk out. Uh, give is unto the Lord. Whatever God speaks in your heart to give, if it's a dollar, if it's a penny, if it's $500, we don't care, just as long as you obey God. Amen. But give us unto the Lord tonight. We appreciate you so much. Be back in this house at 1030 a.m. on Sunday morning. Have your shouting shoes on, your dancing shoes. Amen. Because we're going to have a good time in the Lord.